Good morning. I'm Mary Beth Mars, and it's my honor to serve as undergraduate dean for the Robert J. Trulest Senior College of Business. Thank you for attending today's Distinguished Alumni Lecture, a decision I'm confident you're going to be glad you made once you, we have completed today's session. The Trulest College of Business places a high priority on our collaboration with alumni, corporate partners, and academic colleagues. In fact, earlier this week, our college hosted a forum on the current financial crisis to a standing room only audience. Similarly, the Distinguished Alumni Lecture with the Chairman and CEO of a global Fortune 500 company today is another part or el important element in fulfilling our educational mission. It gives me great honor to introduce our Distinguished Alumni Lecture speaker, David Novak, to you. Mr. Novak is the Chairman and CEO of Yum Brands, which is the world's largest restaurant company in terms of system units with nearly 35,000 restaurants and over 110 countries and territories with global annual sales of $10 billion. For the students in the audience, you're probably frequent diners at some of Yum Brands restaurants, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and A&W All-American Food. While you may know this company more for their late night drive throughs you will soon learn more about David Novak and his leadership philosophy that has propelled Yum Brands to the position of the world's largest restaurant company. The bio of Mr. Novak in the program provides details of his background. I'll just note that he began his career with a bachelor's degree in journalism from here at Mizzou and has since returned as an executive in residence for the Trulass College of Business and in 2006 he served as Grand Marshal for Homecoming here at MU. Prior to leading Yum Brands, Mr. Novak was president of both Kentucky Fried Chicken and Pizza Hut. He also held senior management positions at Pepsi-Cola Company, including COO and Executive Vice President of Marketing and Sales. Mr. Novak serves as Director of J.P. Morgan and Chase Company, the Young Brown Foundation, and the Business Council. He is also the author of The Education of an Accidental CEO, Lessons Learned from the Trailer Park to the Corner Office. Under his leadership, Yum Brands is recognized as one of the best places to work for women and minorities by Fortune Magazine and has received numerous awards as well. Yum Brands continues to expand globally with a focus on China. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to present to you today Yum Brands Chairman and CEO, David Novak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have to tell you, when I graduated from the University of Missouri in 1974, I didn't think I'd have the honor and privilege to be talking to, to students, but, uh, and especially all of you. So it really is an honor to, to have some time to, to chat with you about whatever you want to talk about. I, I'm glad this is a question and answer format, and um, I'm, I'm open to answering any questions that you have out there. But uh, it's a very challenging time. Uh, I know in business and in the world today, and uh, uh, so I think we'll have a real good discussion. So, so let's go ahead. All right. Now I believe we have some students here who would like to ask you some questions, Mr. Novak. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My right. name is Ryan Wenk, and I'm a junior accounting major. Thank you for spending time with us this morning. I was recently involved in a trip to Wall Street where I gained insight into the current financial crisis. My question for you is, what impact current or future will the financial crisis, and in particular, the liquidity crisis, have on your business? Well, right now, it's having a very bad effect on our stock price. Uh, just like so many other companies, we've, we've really taken a tumble in the past couple of weeks. We've gone from like a $39 uh, share price to uh, $25. And we're basically the same business. And you know, I just had an earnings call this past week and, and talked to our investors and, and analysts and, and basically talked about the staying power that we have a, as a company in, in both the good and, and, and the bad times. We're very fortunate to have an outstanding balance sheet. We generate over a billion dollars of free cash flow. This is after we spend uh, $900 million uh, investing in our business around the world. And China, which is one of our big growth engines in terms of new unit development, uh, we generate a lot of profits in China and actually self-fund all of our development for, for new units, which is a big growth driver of our company. So we expect that to continue because China uh, continues to, to grow very rapidly and uh, 
the economy there is slowing down from like 10% to, to 8, 8%, but that still makes it the fastest growing economy in the world. We also have a lot of rapid development outside the United States and outside of China, but that comes primarily from our franchisees who open up about 90% of our restaurants. I think the liquidity could have some pressure on them in terms of raising capital, but the, for us, the good news is our franchisees outside the U.S. are very well capitalized, and they're going to have better access to, to, to money than most uh, companies. So we think that our growth engine and the growth drivers can continue to be funded through our cash and the, the, the franchise strength that we have outside the U.S., and I think the, the, the big challenge that I think we all face right now is what is the impact that's going to be on the overall economy. You know, in the past uh, couple of months, I think the last uh, uh, unemployment figures were 6.6%. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that that number is going to be going up. But the good news for us is that our, our brands have had staying power over the years in tough recessionary periods. As you all know, as consumers, I hope you're all consumers, uh, you can go to Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and KFC, and, and you can get very good value. And that value makes us very affordable even in the toughest times. So we've done much better in tough economies than, than, than other, other brands and, and other companies. So we think we're well positioned. I'd much rather be operating in a, in a much better economy, but we know we have the strength to, to carry on and carry on successfully. Uh, good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Zhu Sheng. I am a journalism student. Uh, my question is, um, uh, in your book, you mentioned um, you were not a serious student during your first couple years in um, uh, first couple years in school of journalism uh, as a student in Mizzou. So I was wondering, uh, but not until you took a class, uh, an advertising class in the school of journalism. So um, from that class, you began to enjoy. Um, influencing perceptions and changing and reinforcing um, uh, different kind of uh, perceptions and behaviors. So I was, my question is, do you still um, apply what you learn from class to young brands and how? Thank you. Yeah, well, it's really interesting. You know, my first couple years at Missouri, I was not really a good student. And I think it was because I really wasn't passionate about anything besides just having a good time. And, you know, as I got into my junior year, I, I got into journalism school, and I did get very passionate about advertising because I finally found something that I really loved and I wanted to get really good at. And I like the idea of, of getting inside the minds of customers. And I know all of you are in business school and or journalism school. I think no matter what you do, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the customer and understand who you're trying to influence. And, and that really excited me and, and, and turned me on. And I've, I've used uh, that that passion that was, I think, grounded and formulated in, at, at Missouri in business uh, since, since day one. In fact, one of the questions I always ask myself when I have any, any business issue or I uh, have any challenge, I always say, what, what consumer perception, habits, or belief do I need to change, build, or reinforce to really grow the business? And, you know, I do that in everything that I do. In fact, I ask that same question when I think about our organization. I say, what, what are people thinking today? Where do we want them to go? How do we get people to, to get aligned and march in the right direction? The only way you can do that is to get inside of people's heads. And, you know, I, I started learning that at, at, in, in school, and I kind of hopefully I've taken that to a whole different level with my experience. In fact, one of the programs that I teach, and I've been teaching this for the last 10 years, is called Taking People With You. And it, it's all, I try to share the importance of really understanding how people are thinking so you can really influence their behaviors and get great results. So it's something that I started uh, learning a lot about at Mizzou, and I hopefully uh, am, am using it every single day as I go to work. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Blake Gooding. I'm a freshman business student here at Mizzou. And my question for you is in regards to your new market in China. How have you had to adapt your marketing techniques that you've used in the United States to apply for uh, or, or to account for the cultural differences in China? 
Well, one of the great things that, about our brands uh, with pizza and KFC in particular, they travel very well. I mean, people love chicken and pizza all around the world. So our brands are basically 80% the same everywhere we go. And China is no exception. Now, one of the uh, big opportunities we have in China is Chinese people love uh, chicken. And, uh, you know, but they like a different kind of chicken in the sense they like spicier food. So we have uh, our most popular product in China is called the Zinger. It's a spicy chicken sandwich, and it is absolutely a, a home run over there. So we have spicier foods, but our original recipe chicken does extremely well there as well. The other thing on the pizza front is the Chinese people really like fish. Uh, so we have some fish pizzas, shrimp pizzas, lobster pizzas, and they do extremely well. So we've tailored our menu somewhat to really uh, adjust to adjust to the cultures. But the good news is the basic brand, the basic format of our brands does extremely well. One thing we're doing in China that we're really excited about is, guess what? The most popular uh, food in China is Chinese food. So what we're doing in China, which we're doing nowhere else in any of our other uh, countries outside the United States, is we're actually creating a Chinese fast food brand. Because we're right now uh, competing in a marketplace that has uh, over a billion people there, billion three, and the middle class is already 250 million people. And we think clearly there's going to be a need for a Chinese fast food concept. So we created a new Chinese fast food concept called East Donning. Uh, we now have it in three cities, and that's really tailored to the, the, to the local taste. And we're very optimistic that that can do extremely well. We expect in China someday to have at least 20,000 restaurants. And uh, we think we'll be every bit as big, if not bigger, in China than we are in the United States with our three brands that we have here, when we have about 18,000 traditional restaurants here in the U.S. Thank you very much. My name is Kimberly France, and I'm a journalism major here, specifically that of advertising sequence, and I have a question for you. Um, in your book, you mention um, managing adversity. Um, as a senior journalism student, interested in a position in corporate PR, what advice can you give me as I seek out an internal corporate PR position, um, knowing that I, too, will have to deal with the future corporate crisis? Well, I think inevitably when you're in business, you're, things are not always going to go your way. and You're going to have a crisis. And I think the biggest thing, Chinese, that saying I'm sure you've heard is, uh, is crisis equals opportunity. I think crisis also gives you the opportunity to breed real trust in your brand and in your company because how you respond in crisis really says a lot about you. You know, it's easy to be, you know, humming along, being a great person every single day when the sun's, you know, is shining and everything's great. When all of a sudden thing goes the other way, what happens? You know, you really see what a person is all about. Same is true with a brand or a, a company. And, and I think what we try to do is, first of all, you just say, you know, this is a real opportunity for us to really – let everyone know exactly what we stand for. We can build more trust with our customers as we go for go forward. So we say, first of all, don't panic. Get all the facts. Communicate the facts when you know them. Always tell people what you're doing to fix the problem. And then after you fix the problem, go back and tell everybody what you're going to do to make sure that you never have that problem again. So I, I think the big thing here is to, is stay cool. Don't panic. And, and get down to, to finding a solution. You have to keep the faith. You know, you have to have real confidence what your company is, what your brands are, and you have to have confidence in your people so that you can truly respond in, in efforts like this. And I think right now our country and our world is in, is in a crisis, and I think our leaders really need to be more out front right now. They need to be calming people down, have a, laying out what the future really ought to look like, and instead of looking like, you know, we're just bouncing from one problem to the next problem, you want to have a real thoughtful approach as you go about solving any crisis. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Ashley Bell, and I'm a business student here at Mizzou. In your book, you discuss that you were able to assemble a top-notch marketing team for Pizza Hut headquarters in Wichita, Kansas. What do you believe are the keys to creating a successful team, and what incentives did you use to attract these people to your team? It's interesting, you know, I was a part of PepsiCo at the time, and PepsiCo, the Pepsi was based in, in New York, and Taco Bell was in Irvine, California, and, uh, you know, we had Pizza Hut out in Wichita. We were part of a company, uh, part of uh, PepsiCo, but we were in Wichita, Kansas, and people said, oh, my gosh, you know, Wichita, Kansas, how can you get people to come to Wichita, Kansas? Well, the reason why people came to Wichita, Kansas is that we were growing the business, and we had a real commitment towards people. 
And so when people walked in and they interviewed with myself and the other people in the company, we had growth. And people want to be around growth. And you know, so what we did is we found people that wanted to live in the Midwest and, and we found people that were really smart. And when, we, when they came in and they met with our people, they knew that they were going to learn a lot and they were going to be around growth. And I think growth is what excites people. And I think as a leader, what you do is you have to do is you got to create a culture and a work environment where people really want to work with you. And, and I think that's something you're going to feel. When you guys go out and you start interviewing, you're going to walk into a corporation or a company or small business or whatever, and you're going to feel almost immediately what it's like to work there. And you got to trust those instincts. So I think when people walked into Pizza Hut back in 19, whenever that year was that I was there, when they walked in, they felt the energy. And when they met their people, everybody was excited about what we were doing. And then you want to be a part of that. And I think that's, that's the best way to uh, recruit great people is you've got to have a growth environment. And we were growing the business. Uh, but you also have to have this, you create the environment where it's contagious and people want to be a part of it. And that's, I think, the thing I'm most proud of in our company is that we created a work environment where people are really valued, where people have fun. And when people walk into our building, they feel the energy that we have. And then when they meet our people, everybody says, geez, this is, this is the place to be. And that's how you get great people. And great people do not want to go to work and work in a dead deadly environment. Great people want to go work in an environment where they know they're going to be coached and developed and they're going to be excited about the environment that's really created. And I've tried to do that wherever I've been. And I'll tell you another thing. When I find a really great person, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that person get out of my office without them knowing that I want them and I'm personally committed to doing whatever I can do to make sure that uh, we land them. And because talent is the hardest thing that you can find. And when I find a leader, believe me, I am all over that person like you can't believe. Uh, I, that person is not, we're going to get him. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Elizabeth Bainbridge, and I'm a senior advertising student in the School of Journalism. Um, my question re is in regard to your book. Um, you place great value on the importance of first impressions. As a senior journalism advertising student looking to get a job soon, what recommendations do you have for me as I make many first impressions in the corporate world? Yeah. Well, I think that you know you got to look at every every opportunity as an opportunity. You know, you, you know, people are always watching. You know, and, and you know that first impression is, is 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 so critical. And so, like, I think when you go in, even in your first day, you know, you want to walk in through those halls like you're ready to accomplish something. You know, uh, people, you know, if you're just kind of moping along, you know, I think show your energy. You know, people, the one thing that, uh, you know, I, I think I was watching Richard Branson talk, and he was, you know, from Virgin Airlines, and he was talking about it. He said, passion and commitment, you know, that's the key to success. And I think people who are constantly demonstrating that, that's an impression that will people remember you. You don't want to be a brown spot on a brown wall. Okay? You want to be someone who's really making an impression. And I think being something that you love. If you're doing something that you love, you're going to be passionate about it. And then show your commitment. And people see that. I think that's, that's always a lasting impression. You know, when I interview people and they're sitting back like this and, you know, well, what do you think? And they're like this, you know, uh, they don't have a chance with me. But if they're up here like this, you know, and they're on the, they can't wait to tell me about what they did and why they need to be in this company and what they can do for it, then they can get my attention. Same way with people. That's an impression I think that will stick with people. Good morning. My name is Adam Craig. I'm a freshman business student. Despite being recognized as one of the top CEOs, do you feel you are still learning important lessons in your role? You know, I think that I am a continual work in progress. I, I, I could spend, we don't have enough time to talk about all the mistakes I have and all the opportunities that I have to become a better leader. But one of the things that I, I, I try to always do is, is I call it kind of the, the hot shot exercise. I always say to myself, you know, David, if somebody came in today and took your job, what would they do? And, you know, I think when, when I do that, when I ask myself that question, it points me to look at the things that I haven't done. 
Because that's what you would do if you had somebody come in and replace you. They're, they're going to try to do the job a lot better than you. So I continually ask myself, what would someone else do if they came in and looked at our business you know, from a very objective perspective? What would they do to grow it? And then I also continually get feedback from other people about my own performance. You know, at all levels in the organization, you know, whether I'm talking to somebody that's, you know, uh, a cook or someone that's on the front line or I'm talking to a vice president, I always ask, well, what could we do, do, what could we be doing that would make us a better company? What could I be doing? What would you like to see me doing that I'm not doing today? And I think that, you know, one of the things I always say about businesses that's great, it's, it's the unfinished business that's out there. You know, that's what the job of the leader is, is find that unfinished business and go make it happen. And I look at myself as, a, as clearly an unfinished, uh, unfinished person because I've got a lot, lot more to do. And I want to be doing, I want to be continually doing more to be better, a better person in every way I can until the day I die. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Michelle Whitesides, and I'd like to thank you again for speaking with us today. And I really appreciate the enthusiasm you've shown so far in answering our questions. Um, I'm a you. senior journalism student here, and I hope to pursue a career in the world of advertising. With your lengthy resume and um, years of experience in the agency world, and having been exactly where I am right now, is there any advice that you can offer me in my active pursuit of a job? Well, you know, unfortunately for all of you, you're, you're going into the job market now at a really tough time. It reminds me, you know, back in 1974 when there was, that's when I went into the job market. It was, it was unbelievable. Here I had this great degree from the best journalism school in, in, in the world and ready to go. And, and it was tough. It was tough. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest advice that I can give you is get in the door. See, you know, find a place, you know, don't, you know, just get in the door and start working, okay? And you don't have to have the, the, the very best job that, you know, might not get the ideal job that, that you, you'd want to have to start out, but get in the door, and then your talent and your leadership will take over. And I think that, you know, what you, you know, the one tough thing about journalism and advertising is people want experience. What do you not have when you usually <laughs> you graduate? You don't have experience. So somebody has to take a chance on you. So I think, you know, showing that your, your passion, your commitment, your de desire to do what it takes to, to get in the door, you know, to start out low and work your way up. I think that ambition and desire is really going to have to have to come forward for you to get that that first job, and I think it's even going to be tougher now. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, do whatever you can, pound as many doors as you need to pound. If you feel like you got a good place where you can get started, even though it may not be the best possible job that you could have, get in the door, get that experience, and I'll tell you what, two or three years from now, you'll get a much better job. And, you know, that's when your talent and your leadership will take over. And so hang in there. And I'm sure you're, you look, I'm sure you're very talented. I'm sure, you, you know, you got a great degree. But if you've been a leader and you've got talent, I guarantee you 10 years from now, you're going to be doing something great. So, so stay confident and, and stay after it. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Ben Carrier, and I am a student at the College of Business. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about your philosophy of positive reinforcement through rewarding and recognizing employees. My question to you is, how do you go about that process to ensure that the recognition is truly unique and special to the employee? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things when I became president, uh, you know, I really had a high value on, on recognition. Um, because one of the things when I was the chief operating officer of Pepsi-Cola company, I went out and I always talked to the route salesmen and the people on the front line. And, you know, one time I was doing this round table with 10 route salesmen in St. Louis and I, I was asking them about merchandising. I said, you know, tell me about merchandising and, uh, you know, who's doing it well and, and uh, what you, what's key to that. And everybody started talking about this guy named Bob who was at the end of the table and they were saying, you know, Bob is the best merchandiser in our company. I went out with Bob one day, he showed me more than I learned in five years. And I looked over at uh, Bob and Bob was like crying. And I said, Bob, why are you crying? He said, I've been in this company for 42 years, and I didn't know anybody felt this way about me. And then I said to myself, if I ever have a chance to be a president of a company, I'm going to make recognition a huge value. I want to have the Bobs of the world know 
that what they do is important and it's, and it's appreciated. So when I became president of KFC, I wanted to make sure that recognition was a big value. So I, I kind of used my marketing technique. What do most presidents give away? They give away a clock or a plaque or whatever. I gave away a rubber floppy chicken. Okay, this rubber chicken, and I gave away $100 with the rubber chicken whenever I saw somebody doing something that was great because you can't eat a rubber chicken. Now, people thought this was like nobody had ever done that before. It was so different than any other president. But what I loved about doing that was is it, I said, hey, we're going to have fun. I want to have fun in this company. And I was able to personalize it. I would write on every one of those floppy chickens what that person did that uh, made them special. And, and uh, you know, I had a lot of fun with it. And now everybody in our company has their own individual recognition award. And it's very personalized. Like this is the one that I have at Yum. This is the Chairman's Award. This is the uh, catching people walking the talk on behalf of our customers. And then every leader in our company has their own, own recognition award. This is an award that was uh, given away in Jacksonville. It's the You Can Award. Uh, but everybody in our company is expected to have their own individual recognition award. And the best kind of recognition is when you give a piece of yourself away. You give your heart away. You know, I know that may sound a little bit corny, but it's like, you know, you don't just go recognize somebody and say, here. You know, you tell it, you, you let people genuinely know that you appreciate what they did. And, you know, I, we have a lot of fun with recognition. And every one of our recognition awards tie back to what we do. You know, like one of the things I try to do as a company is catch customer mania. I want, I want people walking the talk, making our customers happy. You know, so I, I always talk about that being important to me. And so that's why I do this. Uh, you know, we have people in development who give away a shovel, you know, because they're into development and they're opening up new restaurants and breaking ground every day. But then you appreciate people in your own unique way by letting people know that what they do is very valued. And I think recognition is the privilege of leadership. And when you're a leader, you can make or break somebody's day. And if somebody's doing a good job, they need to know it, even if you're just saying thank you. So, you know, we have a lot of fun with recognition. We try to make it unique. We have very informal recognition like this, okay? And then we have formal recognition where we recognize the top 10% with uh, different kind of incentives and, and things like that. So it's a lot of fun when you, when you, when you recognize others. I encourage you to start doing that day one when you go to work, even if it's saying thank you, okay, or I appreciate you being a good coach. You, you know, thank you is two most powerful words in business, or the one, what, I don't know if it's one word or two words, but it's a very good word. Hello, Mr. Novak. My name is Laura Eisenbeis. I'm a junior marketing and economics major. Um, I'm curious, where did you get the idea for multi-branding, and how has it contributed to the growth of Yum! Brands as a company? Yeah, multi-branding is when we put more than one brand in the same restaurant, like pizza, combining Taco Bell and KFC. Uh, this idea actually came from one of our franchisees who asked to do it, uh, and we, we gave him permission to do it. It was very successful because people love the idea of, of getting that branded variety in, in one single, single place. Consumers love choice, and they love branded choice. So it actually came from uh, a franchisee. Interestingly enough, uh, the, I thought this was going to be the biggest idea we had in our company was to combine our units. It's, it's a good idea, but I've not been able to make it a huge idea because it's been very hard to scale uh, and get all of our franchisees behind it because, you know, I underestimated the cultural ethos of, of the fact that Taco Bell franchisees, most of them, you know, want to just do Taco Bell. That's what they grew up with. That's what they want to do. Most KFC franchisees just want to do KFC. So... I think it would be a huge idea if we could convert the whole United States to it so that we could leverage our advertising power and scale. But as it stands now, it's, it's more of a tactical idea versus a big strategy for us. But the consumers definitely love it, and the idea came from a franchisee. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Weston Merrick. I'm a junior finance and economics major. Um, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Good to hear. In your book, you indicated... <laughs> In your book, you indicated that when you met Warren Buffett, he told you, make sure your ego lies in the performance of the company, not the performance of the stock. How has this conversation with Mr. Buffett influenced your leadership style and decision-making? 
Yeah, I, I really think he was right about that, especially today, given where the stock is. <laughs> um, you know, I think that what he was basically saying there is, you know, sometimes your stock can go up and you might not have as good a business as you think you have. And your real challenge is to make sure that you're building that business every day and making it as good as it can possibly be. So, you know, put your performance in the business performance, not the stock price. And, and that's where I think, it, you know, part of my philosophy is, is to always be defining reality. Always be looking at where the unfinished business is in your business, identifying where, where it is, and then going after it. And I think if you do that, the stock price will take care of itself. I think if you just keep growing your business and doing the right things, you're going to wake up one day and your stock is a heck of a lot higher. You know, when we were spun off from PepsiCo in 1997, uh, we were sort of seen as the, uh, uh, you know, the black sheep in the family. Uh, we had had very poor performance, but we went out building our company the right way. We created a, a great culture. You know, we focused on uh, getting better and better, serving our customers, building a global business. Today, we're a global business. And then 10 years later, our stock was up five times. Now, during that period, we had a lot of volatility where our stock went down, went up, went down, went up. But then if you look at the line after 10 years, our stock went up five years, five times. And I think the reason is, is because we were focused on the business, not the stock. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Kathleen Brown, and I'm a freshman accounting student. In your book, you mention your idea of Crystal Pepsi, which was considered by some as one of the worst new product ideas of the 20th century. So my question is, how would you say that this and other failures have helped you grow both pers personally and professionally? Well, you know, Crystal Pepsi, if you read the book, I thought it's the biggest <laughs> idea I ever had in my life. In fact, I, I understand that Pepsi's even thinking about uh, coming out with the product like that now. It's sort of in the, in the, in the, in the, the pipeline. But it is a great idea. But what I learned there was that I, I, I learned a lot about humility because this was an idea that I had. This was back in the days when, you know, right now there's lots of alternative beverages. But back then, the Pepsi category, the cola category, even the diets were starting to slow down in terms of growth. And the alternative beverages like water and Snapple and teas, different products like Clearly Canadian, they were really starting to take off. And most of the products that were doing well were clear. So I sat in my office one day and I go, wow, well, why don't we just come up with a clear Pepsi? This is the best idea I've ever heard of in my life, especially since it's mine. So I went off and did focus groups and we did all this research and the customers absolutely loved it. And, you know, so we go out and we put it into test market and gosh, it's booming. It, it's a lead story on CBS Evening News. Dan Rather says, you'll never guess what's going on right now. Pepsi's got a clear Pepsi. I am clearly the biggest genius in the history of the world. And then I had this franchise uh, franchise meeting. And I go to the franchise meetings. They said, David, this is, the, and they were like, there are franchise bottlers, and they own the bottling plants like in Columbia, Missouri, or you pick the, the city. And they said, David, this is a great idea you got here. There's only one problem. I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, it doesn't taste like, it doesn't taste like Pepsi. And I said, well, it's not supposed to taste exactly like Pepsi because it's a lighter cola taste. That's why we're calling it Crystal Pepsi. And they said, yeah, but it doesn't taste enough like Pepsi. And I just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, it didn't really matter, okay? I was like a heat-seeking missile, and we were going to launch this, and we were going to launch this by, on the Super Bowl because Pepsi always does big things on the Super Bowl. So we were just going to get it done. And so we launched it, and we hurried it into the marketplace. We didn't do the manufacturing process as well as we could have done. The product literally had sort of an off taste to it. It wasn't as good as what it was in the lab because the, we didn't field test it properly. And so Saturday Night Live did a special. Uh, back then, they weren't featuring Sarah Palin. They were <laughs> featuring Crystal Pepsi. And so they, they showed this Pepsi, Crystal Pepsi bottle pouring out gravy, okay? Well, that was really... That was a very humbling experience. And to me, it taught me to always listen. Always listen. Understand what the barriers are that people are coming up with and, and then address those barriers. And if I would have changed the formulation, taken a little bit more time to have it have more Pepsi notes, this would have been a home run because we got like unbelievable market share. The problem was is that nobody bought it after they tried it. And that was, and this was a huge idea, poorly executed. The other thing I learned is that I do this leadership program, 
It's called taking people with you. I think I mentioned a little bit earlier. In that leadership program, you know what people love to hear most? They love to hear the Crystal Pepsi story. They love to hear about my mistakes. And I think leaders need to be vulnerable. You know, it was very, I couldn't believe it. I was watching the debate the other night, and, you know, Obama and, and McCain, yet someone said to me, is there anything you need to learn, okay? One of them said, well, my wife could probably tell you a few things, but I've got boom, 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 boom. And then the other one says, well, the only thing I don't know is what, what's next, or what I don't know. I thought that was a crock, okay? You telling me that these guys don't have something they don't have, okay? Both of them. I was, both of them had a great opportunity to be vulnerable, to show people that they've, they've made mistakes. And what people respond to, they respond to leaders who are vulnerable and talk about their learnings. And not, you're not right all the time. None of us are. So I, I've, I've really learned a lot teaching my leadership program because it's been amazing. You know, the more I try to build more and more of the mistakes I've made into the program because I think people learn more from that. And I guarantee you, I learn more from my uh, mistakes than I learn from my uh, successes. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Michelle Horan, and I'm a freshman business student. Um, maybe Crystal Pepsi was a flop, but whoever developed Crunchwrap Supreme needs a raise. <laughs> but on a more serious <laughs> note, um, many children are most impressionable when they're young. I know I tried to be that drive through kid against my mom's wishes. So what then led to Young Brand's decision to remove television programming from uh, programs targeted at children under 12? Well, frankly, our, our brands really aren't targeted at children under 12. Uh, Pizza Hut's more of a family brand, home meal replacement. KFC's more home meal replacements with the buckets and individual uh, sa uh, sandwiches. So we've never really targeted uh, uh, young children as a way to really grow our business. I, I think we've had some criticism in the past from, from you know, markers saying we should do a better job on that front. So it's never really been a big strategy for us. Taco Bell, Mexican food really doesn't have a great deal of appeal to kids to kids so that's you know we've never really targeted uh, 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 kids with uh, Taco Bell as well so I think it's more of just the, the business decision that we we have a limited amount of marketing resources and you know we're much better off going up against the, the people that are more likely to, to, to eat our product and we can drive purchase frequency with them so you know that was a conscious decision that that we've made. Uh, McDonald's, on the other hand, is they built their business, you know, with a kids franchise, um, and so I think that's a much more challenging uh, uh, aspect of, of their business. But I like what they're doing with their children advertising; is they're promoting exercise and and uh, uh, and health and, and and changing Ronald McDonald from a clown into a, an exercise nut. So you know, I think that's good 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 marketing. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Ian Smith, and I'm a junior accounting major. My question for you is, what do you credit as the single greatest lesson you learned while growing up in 32 different trailer parks that has shaped you into the leader you are today? I think I had to move every three months. I had to check into a new school. And so I think it gave me, it taught me how to, how to make new friends in a hurry, how to, how to um, assess situations. Uh, and my mom always told me, she said, David, you're, we're checking into this new school. You better make friends real quick because we're leaving. <laughs> and, and I think it forced me to take the first step. And I think in, in business, in life, and in, in, in with friendships, you know, if you take that first step, you're going you're gonna to get more out of life. And, and I think that in the end, I think what that taught me more than anything was how to take the first step. How to get through the the fear, the anxiety that you have. We all have anxieties. When you go into a new situation, you got to walk through those anxieties. You got to walk through that fear. And you know, I, I guarantee you, when I was checking into schools, I had I had anxiety, I had fear, but I had to walk through it so I could move to the next point. When I go to a meeting where I don't know everybody, even today, even though I've moved all over the place, I've I've you know been all around the world now. And, and just, you know, I got the most incredible experience that, that, that I've been able to have in life. It's just been amazing. If I go into a new situation, you know, I'm kind of shy to a certain extent, and I'm a little nervous, and I have fear. And so this just helps me get over it. You know, people go, 
how can you, you're not shy. And they don't know what's inside of me. I guarantee you, I got anxiety. I am shy. And I, what this has taught me is it taught me how to, you know, take that first step, even when I was afraid to do it. Good morning, Mr. Novak. I'm Sarah Bradley, and I'm a junior accounting major. My question for you is, given the global nature of your company, um, I'm sure you've had to adapt to a variety of different cultures. What has been the most challenging of these differences? I think the biggest challenge that you have when you're a, a multinational company and you're based in the U.S. Is, is making sure that you have people locally on the ground who know how to do business wherever you're, you're trying to do business. Believe it or not, when we first uh, started our company in France, we, we didn't have anybody in France above store that could speak the language. We had a bunch of Americans over there you know, trying to do business in France. It was deadly. Now we have a completely French team from top to bottom. And now, instead of having a business which was doing nothing, KFC has the highest average volumes in the world in France, almost double the, the average that we have around the world. And it's because we got people who understood the country, understood the language, knew how to do business there, could communicate with the people. So to me, the biggest thing, the biggest challenge we have in a global business is getting local talent. Now, we also uh, you know, supplement that talent with uh, people from the United States and certain functions when we, we need to uh, increase the expertise. But the core of that team needs to be local. One of our great successes in China is that we have had the same basic team there for almost 20 years. And they're, they're local. They know how to do the business. That's why we have, you know, this year we're going to end the year with almost 3,000 restaurants in China. But we have a tremendous local team. So building that local capability is the absolute uh, biggest challenge that we have. Because if you don't understand the culture, you can't motivate the people through the language. In a business like ours, where we have like 1.4 million people around the world and 35,000 restaurants, you're dead in the water before you get started. Hello, my name is Jonathan Skaliski, and I'm a freshman business student here at Mizzou. My question is for you, in what areas has young brands chosen to give back to the community and why? Yeah. Well, that's a very timely question for us because right now we're in the midst of our second uh, uh, World Food Program, Global Hunger Awareness uh, Program that we have. Our, our, our future back vision for our company is to be the defining global company that, that, that feeds the world. Now, obviously, you know, we are global. We're in 112 countries. Nobody's more global than us. You know, we have you know, major global brands. And you know, we've had tremendous success in our first 10 years. But in the next 10 years, what we want to be is everything that you would expect from a defining global company. Uh, and so for us, that means we want to have a culture where everyone makes a difference where everyone's valued and appreciated, that we build vibrant brands everywhere. We're always, always reaching, always taking the brands forward. And the other is that we want to be a company with a huge heart, you know, a company that, that truly, you know, cares about our people. We open up doors. We provide opportunities. But we also, in addition to serving our foods, we save lives. So what we've really got passion around is, is saving lives and tying in with the United Nations World Food Program. Right now, when you go into our restaurants, you have the opportunity to contribute to the World Food Program. Last year, we raised $16 billion. Uh, we had 4 million uh, volunteer hours around the world. We spent about $70 million of marketing uh, money to try to build awareness of the hunger issue. And in the United States, we give away millions and millions of dollars of prepared food every, every, every week to, to, uh, to, to people in need. So hunger is our, our big uh, global initiative that we're really trying to make a difference on. As a matter of fact, uh, two weeks ago, I was at the Global Clinton Initiative, and we worked with the Clintons to, to try to put that uh, on, the, on the agenda for uh, you know, the, the world to get even more behind. Uh, we're very passionate about this, and I think we're really making a difference. Other than that, each one of our brands, you know, uh, have things that they do on a local level, like Taco Bell is huge into to the uh, boys and girls clubs, and uh, you know we we have you know we're 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 very much a part of every community that we're in. Hello, Mr. Novak. Um, my name is Molly Walker, and I'm a freshman business student at Mizzou. 
Um, my question for you is, given the current financial crisis, what reassurances have you had to provide to your stockholders and employees regarding the health of your company? Yeah. Well, I think the, the big thing that we can make very clearly, and we're very transparent. You know, I, I, we believe in total honesty, total transparency, and we just talk about our staying power. We just had an earnings call last week, and you know, I, I, I knew there were four big questions about our company. And so I addressed every one of them directly. The one is, is chi as China growth slows down, will your development and your business slow down in China? You know, I re reassured everybody that we could thrive in a, an economy that's growing at least 8% and our unit economics were good. You know, people asked about, will you, ever, will you be able to grow in the United States with, uh, with, with the, the, the economic turmoil that's there? I talked about how, you know, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell are having excellent years this year. We're struggling at KFC. That's the lone problem we have with our profits. And we see ourselves being able to thrive in an economy where people are looking for value and, and, uh, uh, and convenience. People talk about, you know, whether the credit uh, crisis would affect our ability to open up new units or also to, uh, to basically complete a refranchising program where we're selling stores to, to franchisees. And I address it very directly, you know, that, that we have the, the balance sheet, the cash flow, the capitalization that, that allow us to have the staying power in a tough time like this. So, you know, I think uh, after the call, people said, geez, that was, that was very refreshing to really have a, a team like you continually do basically say, these are the questions we know you have, and then we answered everyone directly and honestly. And I, I, think, I think that's what you always have to do. And, and, and I think if you do that, um, you, it'll give you credibility over time. And, and right now, this is a market that is in chaos, but you know things will settle, and people will get back to looking at who really is making a lot of money, who, who really has a business model that works. And when they look into, uh, in, into Yum! Brands, they're going to see that uh, the, same, the same stock that was at $39 is now at $25. And we're one heck of a value. So that's, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Good morning, Mr. Novak. My name is Kyle Clean, and I'm a junior finance and banking major. Um, my question is, in the end of your book, you talk about the importance of taking away something from everything you do. What was your biggest challenge and what was your biggest takeaway in trying to unite Pizza Hut, KFC, and Taco Bell? The big challenge back then in 1997, we were spun off from PepsiCo, three independent brands that were a part of PepsiCo. We, formed, we came together as one, one company. The biggest challenge we had back then was that each, each brand looked at each other because we were so decentralized as a competitor. So, you know, Taco Bell franchisee said, well, why should I care about Pizza Hut or why should I care about KFC? You know, we're, we're independent. But we felt when we came together, we had the opportunity to leverage our scale. And so, you know, the biggest challenge we had was to begin to get people to see each other as a way to, to take the three brands and make our business bigger by working together versus seeing ourselves as, as competitors. One of the first things we did is we formed the largest uh, food purchasing cooperative in, in the United States because we could take the three brands and buy together and provide a lot more uh, efficiency in, in, in terms of food costs than we could if we bought individually. That was just one example. So the other thing is, is we brought people together. And once people, you know, come together and, and see each other, uh, you know, we were able to, to get people to start working together. The other thing that really is a fact is that the, the food service category or quick service category is like $120 billion. We only have like a 10% share of it. So the last thing we should be worried about is fighting each other. And so we thought we were much better off figuring out how to take on the rest of the world than fight within ourselves. And now uh, the biggest advantage we have in our company is that we've leveraged our scale to get uh, efficiency where we ought to get it. And But the biggest thing is, is that we're sharing best practices. We're sharing what works at Taco Bell with what, we're, with what works at KFC and with what works at, uh, at, at Pizza Hut. And people are getting ideas and they're transferring around the world. And so we've taken this big company and made it small and made it a competitive advantage. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Novak. I believe we're out of time now. But and thank you, students, also for your great questions. Uh, before we end, though, I believe we have some mementos for you, Mr. Novak. Donna, if you could do the honors, please. Oh. 
Thank you. First, I believe we have a much. plaque for you that reads, In All Appreciation right. to David Novak, Distinguished Alumni Lecture, October 10th, 2008. And I also believe that you have some mementos, some Mizzou memorabilia there for you as well. And we hope you'll wear it proudly right. as we watch Mizzou beat thrash, hopefully, Oklahoma State this weekend. So thank you again All for your right. time. Well, I think that's going to happen. Let's, let's appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd also like to thank those who helped make today's what event there? possible. Oh, very good. <laughs> uh, the staff from the Academic Support Center and also our development office. Thank you again for attending, everyone. We are adjourned.